Kunis. 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 Good evening, everyone. Lee Breedy is my name, and I'm the president of the United Irish Cultural Centre here in San Francisco. On behalf of the board, I want to welcome everyone here tonight to our very special public meeting. As you might have read in the newspaper or the bulletin or online, the Irish Centre here at the moment is at a crossroads. I know my messaging has been ambiguous up until now, but tonight it will be perfectly clear what road we are taking. So how did we get here? How, how did the Irish Centre get to a crossroads? Well, I can tell you the amount of human energy that's being put into this facility right now is not very sustainable for the long term. I'm going to be speaking mostly of the past few years since I've been heavily involved here myself, originally as a board member two years ago, last year as a vice president, and since January, president of the organization. If you want to find out about the incredible dream that was uh, hatched in the no late 1960s, early 70s about the Irish Centre, you can read this book by Benjamin Klein, which charts the, the roller coaster ride from the first nights that the meetings were held about having a space for the Irish to gather in San Francisco. And all the years up along for the past three or four decades is how things went up in the good times and down with the bad times. But tonight I'm going to talk about the last couple of years as to what has happened here at the Irish Centre. Many of you have probably not been in tune with the place that often for the last couple of years. We see it in the numbers, but we are very grateful for you, for all those members who have contributed greatly to our St. Patrick's Appeal last year, and also to our membership dues, which uh, we rely on to keep the boat floating here. Four years ago, the Irish Centre changed from a 501c3 private social members only club to a 501c3 public charity. Now that was very important for two very important reasons. And that was to allow large donors to make gifts to the Irish Centre and have them to be tax deductible. It made it also more attractive for the Irish Centre to accept grants and support, capital support, from other agencies that give a lot of money to non-profits. However, keep this in mind, the first full year of activities at the Irish Centre in 2018, the Irish Centre lost $344,000 in the first nine months of operation. That was approximately $9,500 a week that this place was hemorrhaging money. Why did that happen? The restaurant was poorly supported, membership dropped off, and the banquet facility, which was papering over the cracks here for decades, dropped off precipitously. The result was in October of 2018, the bar and the restaurant closed, and by December 31st, the banquet facility closed. That meeting on October the 25th, 2018, was a humdinger to me. I couldn't believe the place was closing down. Why hadn't anyone signaled to us that there were serious fiscal problems at the Irish Centre? Personally, I was saddened. Again, I couldn't believe it was happening. The UICC membership were shocked. People couldn't believe that we were being essentially excluded from the building. So after many nights of begging my wife to get on the board, <laughs> She said, okay, now is the time, you can't let it go. So with some conversations with Anne Cassidy Carew, I had met her a couple of times and I just wanted to feel her out as to what I could potentially do. Oh. That, that part of the speech was not rehearsed. Sorry, Ed. So, sussing her out, <laughs> I said, look, we can't let this place close. We cannot let the, the chains and lock and be kicked out of this building. We cannot 
allow ourselves or allow this building to fall away. Think about all the men that gave blood, sweat, and tears. They complained about the suit, they complained about this, they complained about that, but they never let it go. It was here for four decades. So in 2019, I stepped onto the board in the spring, in spring of two, uh, January 2019. And that particular year, there's about 15 people on the board, and the focus was on cutting costs, cultural event space rentals, opening for special events only, and men membership engagement. In 2019, the Irish Centre became more like a community centre. I grew up in Ireland, the community centre was where everybody went. Whether it was for, you know, buns and tea after mass on Sunday, or you went with your local GA club to take your picture for the yearbook. You went there for concerts, you went there for shows, you went there for dances, you went there and had your first discos, you had your first kiss there. So, the volunteers came in and helped us out. There was massive layoffs, of course. We didn't have much support on the ground in terms of staff, but we had a meager operation. We cleared $150,000 in 2019 with very strong fiscal management of what we were doing. There was nothing taking on unless it was a wash or we were going to make some money. So, if we were a, five, if we were a Fortune 500 company, we, we would have all got bonuses that year. It was a $500,000 swing in 12 months. 2020, last year, the spring of 2020, we were looking forward to 45 years in 45th Avenue. When people will look back decades from now and ask about what you were doing in the spring of 2020, we're not going to forget. The impact of uh, COVID-19 has been local and also global. We were excluded from this building on March the 12th. The immediate impact, of course, was we had immediately to lay some staff off, the cancellation of events, and more importantly, another blow to the bottom line, a reduction in revenue. As you all know, this was the uh, March 2020, when it's always given us a lift here at the Irish Centre economically. However, all events were cancelled after March 12th. Now, it wasn't all bad news because it allowed the board to take a, a pause. And for three or four months, we had to come up with creative and innovative ways in which to make this place happen again. Now remember, we're still locked out of the building, but out of all that creativity, innovation, meetings weekly on Zoom, weekly, that lasted two or three hours, it was incredible how much work and ideas were out there and that the board was willing to do. Out of the impact of COVID-19 grew two new enterprises. Wawona Gates, which has really helped us in the last year, it is our outdoor, outdoor dining experience, and of course, we had the Irish shop, who's, who has... <laughs> Jocelyn loves the shop. <laughs> but it's been a godsend. The amount of revenue that Wabona Gates and the Irish shop, just two very simple ideas that were put to work, floated this boat. If you want to find out more about the details of the finances, you'll have to come to the members meeting next week. But safe to say, the Irish Centre is on firm, solid financial ground. Strong fiscal controls, there's no waste around here. It allowed us to engage our membership. My goodness, we had, I think they were neglected for years, but we've done everything in our power to include them. The cultural programming went dark for five or six months. By September, we were opening up and having Irish dancing schools uh, have exhibitions out in the back. I built a small stage out there. People said I was crazy. Some people said I was crazy not to. We had pancake breakfasts. We had all kinds of things going on. Anything to draw the crowd and get people out. We made further investment. They said we were crazy. $10,000 for a big top? Who's going to come? Why wouldn't they come? They had no place else to go. <laughs> Here again, there was volunteers I never saw darken the door of the place, and it was great to get to know them when we put the big top up. That's no disrespect to the 150 or 200 volunteers that have come through these doors. Things are getting scarce on the ground of volunteers. Things are opening up. They have other things to do. They have other centers and cultural institutions to save. But we will keep marching on to the beat of our own drum. We still are continuously coming up with ideas to generate money here. Remember, in only in the last couple of weeks have we been allowed to open up for small private events. The stranglehold that's been upon us for the past 12 months is, is unbelievable. I, I have to put, take my hat off to anyone in the hospitality industry. 
The amount of effort that it takes to run a small operation like Mavona Gates, I safely would say there's 60, 70 hours a week at it. Any individual here running that type of operation across the city, it's incredible. I've become a strong tipper ever since. <laughs> so, to get back to why we're here tonight, in the fall of 2020, after a very successful St. Patrick's appeal, and there was GoFundMe um, requests and asks for all kinds of different organizations, and we got to the forefront of that, we developed the St. Patrick's Appeal in May of 2020 and we launched it. And at the end of the year, we had $160,000 contributed to that appeal by over 500 individuals. So then the conversation started to go around, my goodness lads, you're making piles of money at Bobon Gates, what are you going to do with all the money? So anyway, that's been stashed away into the war chest, but there was some conversations about giving something tangible back to the members. We had a roof that was leaking the year before. We have a HVAC system that's reduced to iron oxide, and that's rust if you don't know what that is. Uh, we contemplated on saving even more energy by putting solar on the roof. Now those conversations, one man that I had conversations and a cup of tea and a muffin one time in, on the, in October of last year, doing some proactive work in advance of the rains, and that was with Redmond Lyons. Now Redmond Lyons is that man that stood up I think before or after me on October the 25th, 2018 and said, we need to do something incredible here. I thought he was crazy, I still think he is. <laughs> but Redmond and I continue to have conversations. I told him, give me some time till I figure out if this place can be saved in 2019 and again. In 2020, who would have thought we'd have been forced out of the building? So in 2021, early this year, I got a group of people from the network of people that I knew who were interested in doing something great at the Irish Centre. And the question was, should we even invest in the building or should we invest in the community and the people that make this a community? Several options were explored. No, no action, remodel and add a, add a few floors. Maybe we should sell the building and move elsewhere. Start over with a rebuild. Let's go through some of the options. No action. That would be basically all of us giving up and saying we tried our best but it wasn't good enough. Allow the building to deteriorate and keep putting band-aids upon band-aids. Believe you me, Johnson & Johnson have sold many band-aids to this place. We have tremendous facility issues, physical plant issues, HVAC, electrical, ADA, non-compliant in some parts of the building, elevator, the roof, new codes coming down the pipeline for the fire alarm. We would essentially have to rip open the walls here to do anything of value to upgrade the systems. The idea of a remodel, which was the lesser of two evils, I suppose, or add another couple of floors. After further discussion, it was proved to be too cost prohibitive. It would not, not add one extra square feet to our facility here as it stands. A really difficult thing to do to work within the shell of a building, ripping it back to the studs. Five million dollars was a conservative cost. Remember, you would be burying it in the floors, and burying it in the ceilings, and burying it in the walls. You would never see that money. There was very little appetite for that. Now, to sell the building and to move elsewhere, again, it's almost like San Francisco 49ers moving to Santa Clara. God, we could never do that. If I was mayor, hell no. <laughs> this is the ancestral home of the Irish who had been floating around the city going from post to pillar looking for a place to lay their hat. The KRB Hall had fallen away, it eventually burnt down in 2007. Why would we walk away from this place? The start over for a rebuild was the one that got the most traction and the one that got people excited. And the reason being was it allowed us to start with a blank slate, to think big and to discover what does the community need? Could we make it a destination again? When this place was built in the early 1970s, it was a state of the art facilities. You could not get a dinner here on a Sunday night. They were queuing out the door. It was like St. Patrick's Day on Wawona Gates. Who'd have thought? This is a chance to put an iconic flagship building for the Irish Arts and Culture on the West Coast here at the corner of 45th and Wawona. We can develop a cultural asset for the Irish diaspora. And more importantly, in the words of my brother-in-law and great treasurer, Craig Viewig, we need to activate this building. In its present form, we cannot do that. Start with a blank slate and provide space for a library, a museum, 
dance, music, language studios, an art gallery. There's an opportunity here to leave a great legacy, a landmark project on the West Coast for Irish Americans people and the entire community outside of the Irish Americans. We would need to build and leave behind a sustainable building that would pay for itself year over year over year. Strong management, fiscal control. We should never what, allow what has happened in the past to repeat in the future. The good news is that we have tremendous ground, grassroots support at the ground level from everyone that I've reached out to. Everyone who wants to do this project. It's an incredible vision. It's an incredible dream. I ask you tonight to get behind this. We will need your time, we will need your treasure, we'll need your talents to get this thing done. Now, I'm going to hand it over to my very capable VP, Mark Burke, and he's just going to chat about how things are different here at the centre and how we're, we're changing operations to become more efficient and to get the structures in place to build upon the process that we've developed here in the last 18, 24 months. Mark. The board has, has, has turned to focus to you as our customer. We're going to refocus our, our whole vision of the Irish Centre as focusing on the customer, not on paying, not on, not on all these different things that have been kind of distractions over the years, but the customer is going to become the number one thing that we look for. Leading some of the operations over the last year, we found that by appealing to the customer's likes, the Irish Centre can deliver. We are a cultural center. If we can deliver culture to the customer, then we have met our mission as a board. And we ask our customers what they want, and we deliver what they want. We hire employees. We're going to hire employees that will meet getting that culture to the customer. And you have to realize that culture itself is, may not be a profitable business. So ultimately, we will need a facility that will allow us to deliver culture to the customers. I mean, that facility will need to supply other income streams that will allow us to meet the, the vision of this cultural customer center, as an Irish center. To get employees, we're going to need a strong HR presence. So we're investing in HR. My, our evaluation and my evaluation of HR in the past in the center has been, if we have that skill set on the board, it might have been a good, uh, a good thing. If we didn't, as we went to go hire Owona Gates, for instance, we really didn't have the infrastructure really to hire people efficiently. So what this board has done is we've contracted and outsourced in HR so that we don't need to employ HR people, but we can leverage expertise when we need it to identify talent and get them in place to deliver culture to the customer. So our first place that we're investing is in HR and coming up with a new strategy. Another area we're uh, uh, touching is in finance. With finance, we are being led by a very qualified CFO, Craig Vwig. Craig has really transformed finance at the UICC over the past year. You may not see it on your day-to-day -day visits to Wona Gates or the Irish shop, but he is leading us down a path of having financial expertise, but even better, decision support. It's an area that I work on in business. Decision support means you have the information to make good decisions. And the UICC now is starting to get information to make good decisions. We look at our sales week over week. We look at uh, how, uh, how many hours our employees work. Are they working overtime? How can we restrict overtime? And we are making that investment. And that financial intelligence is something that we are, we are, we are also coming up with a new strategy that we're actually taking, so outsourcing some of that to help with getting some of that financial accounting done in the most efficient way, getting it out to what's called the cloud so it's not stored on a server in the basement of the IR Center, and really it's modernizing, again, the finance along with the HR so that we can deliver culture to the customer while remaining sustainable, which is ultimately that we're not losing money. If the customer is happy, if our employees are happy, and we are, are making that nonprofit amount that just kind of keeps us that we're not losing money, then we kind of have what we need as a start. The other area we're getting smart at is in legal and administration. Just recently, we're starting to now send out our contracts and our invoices 
electronically. This is a transformation at the center in that we are leveraging a platform called Square. You'll probably read about it on the news. It's the same system that's being used to sell you a hot dog at Warner Gates. We're now using to rent you a room at the Outer Center, and we are now using to invoice, uh, invoice people, and we can keep track of how customers, uh, uh, customer habits and their frequency, and, and really learn about our demographics. These pillars here, if you think about it, we're talking a lot about what's going to, this meeting is going to be about is about the facility. But the emphasis here is that we are going to invest in all of these areas. And as this facility is being transformed into the future, we will continue to develop our HR, develop our finance, develop our legal administration to make it efficient so that any money spent, any time spent, including volunteers, is valuable. And that's really the vision. And we will do that by not only with the current board, but in the future, we will recruit to need in the board. We will look for needs in the board that we need and ask people like we did this year and say, please come join us in the board. Now, these are the pillars that most businesses run on. We are at the board are going to go after and try to uh, try this new foundation at the IR Center going forward. And with that, there's other areas we're going to, we're going to work on. We're going to, we've really been able to work on a volunteer model the last couple years. We're using online presence to actually request volunteers to sign up for shifts. It's not just text and phone calls. The, the volunteers get a reminder. The volunteers get benefits. And the volunteers become an extension of our employees. They work side by side with our employees, which is really what we want. And we want them to work efficiently and have fun. And I think what Wona Gates has been a great little lab for that, for checking it out. I think you'll find that a lot of our volunteers just love coming out here for a couple hours. They engage with the employees. They engage with our customers. Some of them come back the next day as our customer. And that's exactly what we want. It becomes a snowball. The next area that we are really making an investment in by really doing things that people like is that we're getting customers to become members. We're at record levels of membership. You may not know. Our members will hear about this next week. We're, our membership is actually growing during the pandemic. Why? Because people are seeing, people are seeing progress. People are seeing, I want to be involved. Some are volunteering with time. Some are volunteering with money. Some are volunteering with both. And things like the St. Patrick's Appeal was a way to help the center. Volunteering at Wilbona Gates is a way to help the center. And the ultimate way to help the center is to become an ongoing member, just like Netflix, that you will commit some amount, whether you use it or not. Sometimes you'll use it a lot, sometimes you'll use it a little, and you'll come back around and you'll become a member of the Irish Center. That's one of our growth strategies, and it's actually been successful during this pandemic year to record levels of membership. Now, when I joined the board about two years ago and kind of had involvement maybe a year before that. I was always a lifelong member, had christenings here and so on. I think this is kind of the areas that the, the Irish Center really, they try to do a lot of these things. Again, I think if the board had any of these skill sets, those are good years. If this board didn't have those skill sets, there might have been some bad years. But what we have to be able to do is invest in this. The two areas I think that we can really help the center going forward, and we're already making some progress, is in technology. I myself work in the technology industry and know what software can do for you, something like Square. We have Tom McEwen does the same thing. And we're pushing for technology. Craig, as our CFO, is pushing for technology. Square, we're now using it for invoicing, which I talked about. We're using it also for uh, our contracting. We now introduced this this week for timekeeping. So our timekeeping, if any of you have ever worked at the center, uh, use the old punch card that's been down there for 30 years. We just phased that out in the last week. That's now being replaced by checking in for work on your phone or at the POS system, and then we get immediate reports on labor. We kind of know when overtime is happening, when is not, and that's that fiscal responsibility and that decision support that will help this board and future boards make better decisions. Finally, partnerships. This is the area I think the IRS Center really has to work on. Just had a friend today who was at a memorial today. By the way, it was our third memorial in a row, three days in a row, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We have fed 400 people in that parking lot after services in the last three days. I don't see that as dollar and cents. I see that as an IR center, as a community center, being able to supply a place for mourning, a place for just enjoying each other's company in a safe environment. And I think that's one of the big wins of Ohlone Gates. It's not the dollars and cents which have really helped the center, but really this field of community and we can all hang out with each other, met many, many friends, but these partnerships work. 
It works with partnerships with our neighbors. We want to be partners with our neighbors. We want to be partners with the musicians in the community who have come and donated some of their time to play for us, to help us gather and get a gang people. We've made partnerships like with Millbrae Pancake House. We have a partnership with uh, uh, where we have pancake breakfast. We also have with Ollie down at Fiddler's Green who supplies us bread. He delivers the bread to us, all these great to work with, and we turn around and we sell that bread to our members here in San Francisco, and it's an extension of, of Millbrae of, uh, of Fiddlers right here at the center. Those types of partnerships, I think another one is with the Youth GAA. I was on the board with them and I said, let's get the Youth GAA to sponsor day to come volunteer here. James Quinn uh, recognized that, brought the whole Youth GAA here, and these are the type of partnerships we need to have. We'd like to get the San Francisco GAA dinners back here. We'd like to maybe sponsor a GAA team ourselves and, and have, a, uh, have a say in that league in the future and have uh, uh, be a stakeholder in that. So all of these things together become your IR Center. You're gonna hear about the facility tonight. But as that facility, and we build all our partnerships, and we start investing, even while a building might be being remodeled or built or whatever we're gonna do, we're gonna continue inventing technology, we're gonna continue to embrace volunteers and engage them in the process, we're gonna, uh, uh, the, the members in the process, we're gonna engage volunteers in the process, we are going to then address legal things, we're gonna have legal compliance, we're gonna make sure that we're doing things right, filing our, our, our filings on time, we're gonna continue to do, uh, invest decision support more and more, again, appealing to other board members to join us on either subcommittees or on the committees themselves. With our HR, we're gonna help identify good employees that really wanna be here and that really wanna help the center and, and deliver that, uh, the, the culture to the customer. That facility there is what we're gonna talk about tonight. Just be aware it's more than that. It is a complex web. Moors had succeeded and failed based on their ability to manage all of these aspects. And what we're gonna do is we're, after we figure out this facility, as we do that, that uh, the employees and the culture, it'll come back to you. You as a customer will come into the, uh, a new rebirth IRA Center and you'll have, and we'll be able to know that it can be sustained a long time. Thank you very much. So now I'm going to introduce the architects who last year did about $10,000 worth of work for us pro bono. Um, and that was really looking at a remodel of the iris into repurposing of the space. And when these conversations moved towards a rebuild at the iris center, I said, why not throw them uh, the carriage and have them come on board very quickly. And this is literally in the last six or eight weeks um, that all this has come together in a very short space of time and they've been working day and night on this. So, Thank you for all your work last year. We may not need it. Uh, <laughs> and thank you again for meeting all those crazy deadlines we gave you. So I'll turn it over to Dane Bunton and Nastaran Masavi of Baina Studios here in San Francisco. Hi everybody, thanks for being here. My name is Nastaran, this is Dane. We're Studio Banner and Architecture and Design Company here in San Francisco. Um, thanks, Liam, for the introduction. We began our involvement with the UICC last year. I think it was last fall when we were invited to do a feasibility study um, to kind of look at the possibility of a remodel for this center. Ever since uh, our involvement, the big question that we were always faced with is, what is the future of the UICC? What can be done for this center to continue living its long life for the community? As architects, we're often faced with the challenge of how we can reflect on the past and respect the past while also looking towards the future and into the horizon. We've done a lot of research on this building um, and have been amazed by the forefathers and the community uh, in the 1970s who bootstrapped this building and the construction and paved the way to the center that we know today. Um, without their amazing efforts, uh, we wouldn't be able to be standing here today and discussing the future of the center, so we have to thank them for that. Um, and so going back to the big question that we've been looking at since the beginning, what is the future of the UICC? Um, to us, this is a place that reflects on the past while also looking towards the future. It's not only the past or in terms of the building, it's also looking at the past Irish heritage and looking at the future, uh, the immigrant story of the people who've immigrated here to San Francisco to this day. Um, we're also seeing this as a destination uh, for Irish culture and activity on the West Coast. We've always talked about this center in Chicago, 
uh, how it's become a hub for the East Coast. People go there to get married for other major events. We want that this to be that kind of center uh, here in San Francisco for all the West Coast to enjoy. Um, we, we also see this as an icon um, to the city of San Francisco. So we want this to be a place where someone, when they're visiting, when they're in town, they say, "What well, I have to see what's going on at the Irish Cultural Center. Um, but most, most importantly, um, it's a hub for the community and the Sunset District in the western part of San Francisco. Uh, so that brings us to the next kind of question that we've been looking at. What is a community center and what is a cultural center? Uh, so to us, a community center is its pretty broad. It could be in any community, right? But it's also crucial to the fabric uh, of local life for residents. P places where people can exercise, work and study, socialize, eat and drink. Um, while a cultural center is very specific um, to the Irish culture and the tradition. So it's there to preserve the heritage of through art, music, uh, and dance, and food and drink. So we see the UICC as this marriage between these two kind of typologies uh, and a buzz, buzzing hub of activities, whether it's community, um, but also public and cultural activities, obviously. So going back to the existing building, um, what became apparent to us working with Liam and the board members um, last year is that they all felt this, uh, we kind of realized that they all felt this innate duty to do what the forefathers did. Um, to kind of envision a, a center that could um, that could kind of live for hundreds of years and, and serve its community and sustain itself. And it also became apparent to us in our original study that uh, the remodel we were considering would not be really financially feasible from cost perspective. Looking at the existing building that we're all in, we're looking at a two and a half story structure with a banquet hall, a pub, a library, and a members room handful of offices. But what we could envision for the future is a state-of-the-art six-story structure that could house flexible offices, genealogy center, classrooms, restaurants, sports center, aquatic centers, museums and galleries, an active roof garden with magnificent views. And the list goes on and on. So taking a look at the site, this is just the, basically the site extruded up to orient you, 45th and Wawona. It's an amazing opportunity in this site. Um, but it's also the neighborhood and, and area is changing quite a bit. You have uh, this fairly large development that's going in right across the street on 45th at the Slope Garden Center. Um, that's hundreds of residential units, 85 feet high. There's also another similar development on Slope. Um, so we're looking at maximizing this building. Uh, currently, this is all conceptual at this phase. Um, so it's, it's a starting point in this discussion. Uh, nothing is set in stone, but we're, we're seeing this, uh, our concept starting at the ground floor. We're calling this the extra rooted program. So the second, first, second, and third floors we're seeing as this transparent box diagrammatically that acts as a public magnet, bringing in kind of a modern touch, bringing in some of that public program, uh, and as Liam said, it's a buzzing hub of activity. Uh, above it, we're seeing more of the member-focused areas. So this is uh, a solid mass that's conceptually clad in Irish blue limestone that sits above this glass box. Uh, we're calling this kind of the introvert program. It could be member uh, kind of activities like offices, uh, the gym, et cetera. We can go over that soon. Um, and then how do you start dividing this mass? So we're looking at and getting inspired by all things Ireland. Um, the four provinces, how you can kind of start dividing this mass into four what we're calling hubs. Uh, and then creating these fissures, getting inspired by the standing stones, and creating these fissures in that limestone mass that would allow for light and air and these gardens to penetrate through that massing. Uh, and then we're pushing down on the northwest corner uh, to allow for an amazing ocean deck from uh, the upper levels and getting inspired by these Celtic knot forms, which are simple in the perimeter. It's kind of a box, but it has this intricacy of these weaving and knots that are happening inside of it. Um, so we're going to go through a few images, uh, a lot of images actually, some of the exterior of the building. Uh, these are all conceptual images, so you can see uh, a bird eye view here. This is on the quarter of 45th and Wawona. We can see the uh, Irish blue limestone cladding that's kind of creating both the solid massing and also a skin that allows light to kind of filter through in the upper areas. And then you can see this very active rooftop garden that could uh, be active in, in terms of having a restaurant. Um, looking at the corner here, you're, you can see this big glass mass that's uh, very open and a, a hub of cultural activity. Um, it could 
how it has, it has the museum, it has the library, this new, new and improved St. Patrick's room. Uh, and then on the corner, kind of a slope, we're keeping um, the Emerald Pub in a similar location to where it is. Uh, and then we're using this language of like punch outs uh, that frame the views from the upper levels. So we're going to walk you through some floor plans, uh, starting from the basement level two all the way to six floors. So we're envisioning two basement levels. The first one, or B2, is going to be an aquatic center, uh, a five-lane swimming pool, kids' pool, cafeteria that's going to be shared, a hot tub, a cold tub, and then uh, locker rooms and restrooms. We have two ingress floors that go all the way up to the sixth floor. Uh, we also have this central staircase that kind of takes you down all the way to B2, but then it goes up to second to the third floor, which we'll show you later. Um, we also are envisioning a gallery space that's going to be an extension of the lobby space with, uh, on the first floor. Um, going up to B1 is going to be the parking garage. We're envisioning to have about 40 parking spots here. Um, and then going to the first level is going to be the lobby, museum, and pub. So the Emerald Pub, oh, sorry, Emerald Pub is going to be on this corner. This is 45th Avenue. This is Mwana. We have a, a separate entry for the pub. Uh, there's a museum and lobby here with the entry over here. We have the central staircase that takes you to the second floor and third floor. We have a flexible gallery slash venue space here that could be used for uh, potentially small uh, small uh, gatherings or just for uh, temporary exhibitions. Uh, again, the deeper stores are on these two ends. Um, and then the parking garage entry is also from the Wilhelmina Street. Going up to the second floor is the St. Patrick's room that houses about 400 people. It's about 12,000 square feet. Um, a stage, backstage, um, kitchen, and a bar that, that serves this space. Um, we also have a balcony that uh, faces 45th Avenue and another balcony on this side. Uh, we're kind of envisioning this kind of a, an atrium that goes all the way to six floors, and you are going to see these in the each floor plan. Um, that kind of creates a visual connection between the floors. Um, going up to the third floor uh, is going to be the library. Um, library slash, um, sorry, Dowling Library slash John Genealogy Center. We also have a balcony here for this uh, library. There is going to be a mezzanine seating, VIP seating that kind of facing down to the St. Patrick's level below. Um, and again, open to uh, lobby below over here. Going up to the fourth floor is going to be focused on classrooms and offices. So we're thinking about kind of creating a lot of uh, nonprofit uh, rental offices for nonprofit organizations as well as an admin office for UICC. Um, we're thinking about kind of creating a lot of different classrooms for different types of Irish-related activities like Irish dance studio, Irish language classroom, music, music classroom, and also like a kids' story time and party room. Meeting rooms and conference and lounge spaces are also provided. Going up to the fifth floor is going to be a sports hall with um, a gym space and potentially a squash court or a racquetball court, um, locker rooms and restrooms again, and a yoga studio. So there's a lot of different activities that could happen in this level. We have a cafe space that's facing northwest that we can potentially get some view because we have another um, development that's happening towards on the west side, of it, so we don't really have much view towards west anymore. Um, going up to the sixth floor, the top floor is going to be a combination of a roof garden and members' room and restaurant. So what we're envisioning for the restaurant is this potentially could be kind of like a party room where people can rent it out for office parties or birthday parties and such. And the members room has its own dedicated bar and then all of these spaces are kind of opening up and spilling out to the roof with magnificent views to the ocean. Um, so we're gonna walk you through some interior shots of how the space looks like from inside. Um, so this is the first floor, lobby space, um, entry on this side, you come in and there's a ticket or information booth we're kind of salvaging and reusing um, uh, these brick paving that we have in the exterior of this existing building that has the names of the donors and founders of this um, to kind of like make sure that all those stuff are preserved. Um, there's also, um, so this space is going to be a kind of a museum slash lobby. So what we're doing is we're kind of showing some of these artifacts that are present in this space here currently. 
um, and some of these artifacts have been brought from Ireland. Um, and we have like a gallery space back here, kind of using some of the stone from the exterior of the building here. Um, and this is a staircase that takes you up to the second and third floor. And this is a wooden uh, kind of folding wall that kind of opens up a view from the St. Patrick's Road down to the lobby. And then on the same floor, on the first floor, we have the Emerald Pub. So we're taking a lot of cues from the classic um, traditional Irish pub. Uh, kind of trying to use some of those architectural elements that you see in those types of spaces. We are reusing the blue lamp beams that you see here in the space, um, trying to kind of uh, reuse and uh, refurbish them and kind of uh, keep them in the space. Um, and we're also using some of the um, stained glass that are in the exterior of the building, uh, in this existing building, into this space. Going to the second floor is the St. Patrick's room. So um, here we can see uh, the banquet seating layout where it's going to house about 400 people. Uh, there's going to be a stage, a bar, and then the, the, the VIP seating up here, uh, and the connection to the lobby down here, and then we have all these windows and balconies on the side uh, towards 45th Avenue. Uh, so this is, we're kind of looking at a very flexible space that there could be a lot of different types of activities and events happening. Um, so the third floor is the Dowling Library. So what we're thinking for in Dowling Library is kind of looking at the space as, as a more of a very interactive and very active uh, learning center, a place that is open to people from all age groups, for kids, older people, and kind of creating a space where people can come in and learn about the Irish history and Irish culture, potentially a genealogy center that you can kind of uh, look through your family history. So, Really trying to open, create a very open and airy space that uh, connects itself to um, to the outside, but creating a lot of glass walls and uh, also these viewports that uh, look down to the to the St. Patrick's room. So going up to the fifth floor, we have this what we're calling a sports hall. Uh, so right now you're seeing um, kind of a, a big open gym. You see a cafe in the corner. Um, rock climbing, have all this various activity. Behind us would be racquetball, squash, um, and some other things. So we're seeing this kind of going along the lines of the community aspect of this building, uh, something that people can use on a day-to-day -day and attract more and more members. And going up to the sixth floor, this is the roof level. Uh, so we're seeing this as kind of a, a very special place where you're engaging a lot with the outside. So this is a restaurant here. You have a, a cocktail lounge. You have fire pits, because it might be freezing up there. You have these, these building masses that kind of protect you from the wind. So this is where you really see the concept of, of the, the hubs coming to life. And you see amazing views um, or fog from the upper levels. Um, and so you're really dining and interacting among the stars. So yeah, thank you so much for having us. I'd just like to point out this is a concept. It's looking at this idea of a new building from 30,000 feet in the air. Um, and just as the founders of this building did, they had a big idea. I think it's our turn to bring this to the next generation and have this building for another 100 years or more. Okay. here for a little while longer. There will be a chance to do some question and answering later, Q&A. Um, the next person I would like to call up is um, Robert O'Driscoll, the Consul General here in San Francisco. And while he's coming up, would you please give a warm round of applause for my fellow board members that I'm going to call out and acknowledge here tonight, because I'm only their spokesperson, but I do work alongside them in the trenches all the time. So, Mark Burke, Craig V. Week, hold your, hold your applause. <laughs> Mark Burke, Craig V. Week, Molly Burke, Ann Beglin, Josephine Brogan, Kathleen Krause, Brian Gaffney, Mark Gorman, Shannon McAuliffe, Kathleen McKeown, Thomas McKeown, and Maggie Overbay.
stand up for to be acknowledged just for one second. Well, more than one second. Friends, you didn't tell me you have to follow that. Um, I wanted to start by thanking Liam and the board for inviting me here uh, this evening. It's just so great to see you all in person. I just want to say that. Um, I want to start by recognising that this is potentially an historical moment in the history of our community here in San Francisco. Last year we celebrated 45 years of this wonderful centre on 45th Avenue. And at that anniversary, which was unfortunately largely virtual, we celebrated the inspirational story of members of our community who combined their talents, gave their blood, sweat and tears, and where through board membership and other voluntary endeavours, caretakers of this space, ready to pass it on to the generation that follow. As part of those anniversary celebrations, I was asked to participate in a video by uh, Anne uh, Cassidy Carew, uh, and during the course of that video, it was on the history of the centre, I noted that the first Irish centre here in San Francisco dates back to 1861. And this place only became a city in, 1850, in 1851, or 1850, so it was very, very soon afterwards the Irish wanted to have a home here. That first Irish centre was a benevolent society, with members joining and pulling their savings to ensure they were, they were sick or lost their jobs, that they would not be destitute. It's unsurprising, many of those who arrived here were people who had escaped famine in Ireland. They wanted to make sure that they would be able to survive if anything happened on, on the West Coast. I'm trying to make the point, I think, that the Irish Centre in this city, at any given time over the last 160 years, in any given Irish Centre, has evolved to meet the needs and the wants of the community. The proposals as outlined this evening are part of that heritage, that long lineage here. And the outline a vision for a modern and dynamic Irish Centre turns the page on the next chapter, the proud volume of stories of the Irish in this city. The centre, as envisaged in the vision that's been shown, has potential to be a home for the Irish and those of Irish descent here in the Bay Area into the 21st century, and also to be a meeting point of Irish culture and the multitude of other Irish nation-leading, or the other, the other nation-leading cultural and artistic institutions and communities that call the Bay Area and California in recognition of the truly global nature of our diaspora and Ireland's place in the world and Ireland's very special connection to the United States. It could also be a space where contemporary Irish artists from all across our island and from all the disciplines, music, dance, literature, theatre and screen, could take their first steps to exploring, learning and making connections with the incredibly vibrant cultural activity, cultural and artistic communities here on the West Coast. The Irish government is very proud of our diaspora. We invest in our diaspora. Last year we spent $350,000 across Western America uh, supporting Irish diaspora organisations, including uh, 15,000 here in the centre and 15,000 the year before that, ever since the, the, the move to the 501c3. Uh, we also realised the huge importance of those uh, cultural connections to Irish artists. So we spend a million uh, euros a year to support Irish artists travel to America. The truth is, and we've all seen it, is that not enough of these artists travel west. They, tra they, they typically congregate on the east coast. And my hope is that in a program like this, we can have a home for those artists to come out and to really to explore the, 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 the west coast. We are also doing our bit on this, and this is, we, we see this as a strategic, strategically important for, for, for the consulates here in San Francisco and in LA. And later on this year, we're going to appoint our first ever Irish cultural attaché uh, on the West Coast. That person will be in the position in the second half of the year. We're based in Los Angeles, but we have a West Coast remit. Uh, and I'm very proud that we will be able to invest in a much more strategic way in our cultural connections to this incredible part of the world. Regardless of what happens, of course, the centre will be an important partner in that work. But a new design centre would offer an incredible platform for that cultural exchange, which is just so important. This is a hugely ambitious project. And the Government of Ireland has supported similar projects of scale in London, and of course the Irish Arts Centre in New York, uh, with significant cap capital funding in years gone by. Common points for those projects in securing Irish Government funding 
have been strong governance arrangements. I thought that the presentation here this evening was really, really good in that regard. A sustainable business model. We want to make sure there's something that can live into the future and can wash its own face insofar as any of these, these, these facilities can. But importantly, we must have the collective support of the community, united in a common vision. At a recent presentation of the Irish Arts Centre in New York, we talked about the importance of the journey as a moment to bring together the disparate threads of the community towards a singular purpose, harnessing the skills of Irish and Irish Americans in the Big Apple and beyond to create something special, something meaningful, something worthwhile. As I look at this project, the people involved already, and the enormous talent across this region, I am so excited about what this project might become and the legacy it might leave to generations that follow. It's a legacy that would honour those who built the centre. Uh, built the centre. The centre has been a place for our community to come together for nearly half a century. As the old Irish saying goes, there is nothing we cannot achieve together. So I wish everyone well in this endeavour. Kinyari and Talib, and it's going to be of. Okay, now I'd like to uh, bring in Cassidy Carew, the Director of Cultural Programming here at the Centre to the stage, to speak briefly to the cultural programming here at the Centre and some of the restraints that we have at the present time in terms of space needs and whatnot. Cassidy Crew, as Liam introduced me. Um, I am the cultural, the director of cultural programming here at the Irish Cultural Center. I'm honored to be here this evening um, as the former past president of 2019 and 2020. Two uh, crazy years, if you could, you know. Uh, um, it's hard to follow up after Mr. Uh, the Consul General Robert and his wonderful speech and the architects, but I'm going to do my best to kind of talk about the cultural programming that we are working on um, right now. Um, for many years, the Irish Cultural Centre has lacked the appropriate space to house our overwhelming historical collections and books in the Dowling Library, which has been bursting at the seams for many years. We've been very fortunate to, for the last 45 years to be able to collect donations on behalf of the local Irish community here. The ephemera and artifacts which tell the story of our members and uh, lives here in the Bay Area are piling up in boxes, awaiting display cases and a, appropriate curation in a public setting for which they were donated and provide the space that they are well deserved. We have lots of Irish stories, Irish American stories and San Francisco Irish history that definitely need to preserve, be preserved in a, in a special place. We would like to host traveling art installations here at the center and also provide a forum where local Irish Americans can display their artwork in our own gallery for any period of time, but right now we certainly do not have the designated space needed. Some of our Irish dance schools are crying out for a dedicated space. Unfortunately, we had the, the outdoor uh, uh, stage created this last fall, and it was quite helpful to our dancers. So to have a, a dedicated space in a studio or a Marley, with a Marley floor, our local musicians would love to have a sound and practice studio to work in, while our Irish language classes would love to have a regular classroom in which to learn the native tongue of Ireland. I implore you to look at this beautiful design that's being presented to you this evening, and please be a part of us writing the next chapter of the Irish Cultural Center here in San Francisco. I thank you for your time. Okay, next, um, I'd like to call on uh, Marty Halloran to the stage. Um, Marty is, of course, former uh, POA chief and uh, retired uh, San Francisco Fire De uh, Police Department <laughs> officer. <laughs> That's the problem when you're putting out so many fires here at the Irish Center, you forget what agency to call. <laughs> Thank you, Liam. Ann, I think you left your mask up here. <laughs> uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Marty Halloran. And with me here tonight is my brother, Steve Halloran. We are native San Franciscans 
and we're just two of the sons of Coleman and Rosemary Halloran. I say that because our father, like many others before him, immigrated to San Francisco from a very small village, Kilbrick and Rusmuck, in County Galway, in 1950. Our father, like many others, was eager to seek the American dream by becoming a citizen of this country, but yet he never forgot his home country, his heritage, and the history of his birth country. When the talk of establishing a center for the Irish cultural began in the early 70s, there were many Irish within the San Francisco community that stepped forward to offer their services and volunteer. Our father was just one of them, and my brother Steve, as a budding carpenter, stood alongside our father Coleman and helped work on this magnificent building at that time. The Irish and the Irish Americans of that generation had a vision for this city and a vision for the culture of the Irish in America and in San Francisco. They were determined to build a proper building within the community that would be a beacon to unite the old world, the old country, with the new world, the new country. I believe that is evident that that vision of those men and women who were responsible for this building has long paid off. Well done to them, and a big thank you to all of them for what we have today. We cannot forget that. That was over four decades ago. And, have the, and as the years have marched on, they have taken a toll on this building. Change has occurred, whether we like it or not. Therefore, it is imperative that we too must change. We must adapt. In order to continue that vision and secure the future of the United Irish Cultural Center for the next 40 years and beyond, we must take bold steps now, much like was, what was done back in the early 70s. That bold move is a complete rebuild of the center, a new and modern facility that retains all the best of this building and its history, but yet offers amenities that suit the Irish and the Irish American of today and beyond. This proposal before us tonight is a concept. It's merely a first step, and it is open to discussion and recommendations from all. Every member should have a voice in the future of this project and this building. To preserve the Irish Center in San Francisco, we all need to be practical and sensible, but we also must have a vision, much like those who went before us, and we must be bold in that vision. If we are not, then our community and those who follow us will be the poorer for it, sadly. My brother Steve was directly involved in putting this building, construction of this building, along with my father. So he would like to just speak a few words. Marty, Marty asked me to come up here, and I really didn't know what to say, but uh, this concept looks very beautiful. Uh, I remember many times uh, back in the 70s, early 70s, there we come over the hill from the Noe Valley and take our tools out. And sometimes I'd be putting sheetrock in, sometimes I'd be taking sheetrock out. I don't know why, but it was just. <laughs> <laughs> but I know one thing uh, Dad would say right now is this, this is going to take a lot more than a few volunteers that we did back then. So I, I think it's wonderful. So thank you. So next up, I'd like to call Redmond Lyons to the stage, the man who started this conversation with me back in the fall of 2018. Good evening, everybody. It's great to see everybody here. And sometimes I should just keep my mouth shut. <laughs> 
But anyways, life goes on. Covid comes along and it gives us plenty of time to think. And we start thinking about the vision and the story of a vision here. We look back at what you have done in 1974 and the vision that was built here. I was in, I think, into Ireland in 1974 and I didn't do too well in it at the time. So maybe that's the reason I ended up out here. But that was a really interesting time. And I just want to tell you a story about a vision. Pope John Paul came to Ireland in 1979. He flew out of Knock on a helicopter. Monsignor James Horn. There's a fabulous picture of him lifting both his hands to heaven, looking up at Pope John Paul taking off. And he looked up, and the next day he said, I had a vision. Why don't we have an airport in Knock? <laughs> now, he wasn't too bothered about building committees and strategies and finance committees or whatever, Monsignor Horn at the time. He went to a few local contractors. They found a bog land outside Charlestown in County Mayo, and they started leveling it off. My father heard about it and he said, the man has a screw loose. They have taken all the best bog in Mayo <laughs> for the next 50 years to supply fuel to Mayo and they're putting an airport there. Now, I don't want you to look up at me here and the rest of us and think we have a screw loose. That's a, that's a comment that was very prevalent in Ireland back at that stage. Anybody could have had a screw loose. So, I think what we have here is a vision for the future. And it is something that's just starting out with the concept of what we have saw here tonight. This is an amazing concept. When I made my comments, and even two weeks ago, I didn't understand what really was going to be put before us. The project you see here, I'll just cover a few things. There's a few major questions to be asked here. How is it going to be built? Who's going to fund it? And is it sustainable in the future? Those are the three most important things that answers are, need, are needed for. And I have thought a lot about it because we haven't been too, doing too much else with COVID and that. You know, we have many people available to help out to do something like this. As regards the construction of this, this is a major project. That's a 100,000 square foot the building that you saw up there on that screen. As regards, we expect the building to be a combination of union labor, donated labor and material, and for many of all our friends in the Irish and Irish American community, all working together as was done in 1974. And that is the way we see that it should be built. We have experts in every field. Like we, looking up at me here, there's some amazing contractors, developers in this room tonight that have done 10 times more work than I have done in this city. And they're all willing to help out and give their time and expertise to get something like this done. As regards the building of it, our intent at the moment and we're looking into it, is to have a construction company or a limited liability company develop the project with a project specific insurance coverage which costs about 500,000, naming the, non the current non-profit organization as an additional insured. That is how something like this would be built in this, in this space here. Now, I'll move on. How much will it cost? This is the great elephant in the room that since we started talking the year, two years ago, three years ago about the Irish Centre, how much is it going to cost? You know, we couldn't put a figure on it until we had a concept. It's like the chicken and egg. You know, so now we have a concept. Two weeks ago, a very good friend of Liam's took the drawings, did a major cost breakdown analysis on that building, and it costs over $450 a square foot. So we're talking about 45 to 50 million to see something like that built in San Francisco. That's enough. Millions of numbers. 
It doesn't make any difference if it was five million, you still have to raise five million. It's just a number, but what you're getting is an amazing building on the West Coast. Nothing like it. It's just going to be an amazing building to do. Now, since coming to America, I have been introduced to, and I really like this word, and it's called pro bono. <laughs> and I, I, I actually, because my friend Jim Byrne is here tonight, and congratulations on being appointed to the police commission. And the word is usually used in terms of legal terms and all that type of stuff. So I decided to look it up in the dictionary so that I could understand exactly what it said. <laughs> and it states clearly it means the donation of work undertaken without charge. And that is something we hope to see a lot of in the development. <laughs> and specifically because you're a 5013C non-profit and anyone who donates labor or material are able to use the tax system to get the tax write-off and they get an advantage for doing it. So while we're talking about how much will it cost to be built, where does it go from here? And what happens? I would like, and I think a lot of people are in agreement, that this building needs to be left here to the community free and clear. That the money has to be raised to build the building. That we're not going into debt to put a building on this site here. You know, for the Irish Centre in the future. So in that respect, the fundraising committee set up, you know, and for it to move forward, we need to raise in the next few months about $5 million to show that this can be done. Because if that money is not raised, that's probably 10% of what it costs to do this building. We cannot go to the Irish government, and I'm happy to see Robert here. We cannot go to any of the companies downtown or any of the investment companies or tech companies to fund this project if they do not see that we as a community are not committed to invest in it ourselves. And I know that has taken the smile off everybody's face. <laughs> <laughs> I, I better move on after saying that. that. That is very important to understand, that that has to be done. Now, I looked at how it should be done, and I only need 174 people to put their names forward starting with four people at 250,000 each, 10 people at 100,000, 20 people at 50,000, 40 people at, 40, at 25, and 100 people at 10,000. And those commitments to be made over the next four years. And if that is not done by this community, this project will not be going forward in three months' time because the interest will not be there to support it. And I hope everybody will figure out how to do that. So, there are some things that have to be done then. We have to do a sustainability study in the coming months for this project to succeed. It needs to be done on a floor by floor basis because what will happen with this project is there will be a committee that will manage every floor in this building if it goes ahead, from the restaurant floor downstairs to the gym to an aquatic center, whatever happens or whatever the people want to put in there, you know, it will have to, it will have to support itself. Now, the big discussion about support a building like this, an arts and cultural center, is everybody knows an arts and cultural center does not support itself. Because arts and culture is something special that you have to give to the people. And you have to bring into the people. So, to enhance what's here. So, there are things like membership fees. If we have 2,000 members in this center, just take an average, I don't know what is that at the moment, but, and they each paid $500 a year membership to this center. That's a million dollars. That goes a long way to help sustain 
what will be happening in a building like this here in San Francisco. What do you get? The question, what do you get for your $500? Because the Irish people always want to get something. <laughs> what you get is you get, you get a chance to book a table on the top floor in the members' room, which all the people coming in off the street cannot do when they're eating downstairs. You get a chance to book your tickets to whatever concert, whatever play, whatever art performance is coming to the centre before anybody else gets a chance to book. And if this centre is built, there should be some amazing productions in all types of art and culture coming here for people to come to visit and see. So that's what you get for your $500. You don't get free meals. You don't get free drinks at the bar. You have to pay for all those other things when you come here to, San to, to see it. So, I don't know what else we need to cover. I don't know if you want to open it up for questions. Yeah. Now, Red, uh, we're going to open it up to some Q&A, and so Redmond will stay around to, um, I will stay around if I can answer the questions. So if you have a question that hasn't been already answered in the presentation, you're more than welcome to come to the microphone at the stage and ask your question. My name is Pat Uniak and I'm in charge of the mic tonight. So, I want to make sure it works. So, to make sure it works, I'd like to just uh, congratulate and commend the United Irish Committee here, the United Irish Cultural Centre Committee, and the, the architects and designers for, which, for such a wonderful presentation. It was magnificent. Obviously, <laughs> obviously the, the concept is bold, ambitious, and futuristic. But um, I'd like to also um, uh, acknowledge the wonderful voluntary endeavor of the volunteers that kept the doors of this Irish Centre open for the past 10 years. Without them, without them, this place would have been shuttered. But regardless what happens to the Cultural Centre from this day forward, we must also acknowledge the magnificent men and women of vision that built this Cultural Centre in 1974-1975. The built is a magnificent monument to our culture and our heritage, and we must never forget them for what they've done. So if anyone has any questions, I'll hand them the mic. I want to compliment the board on the visionary concept. Um, San Francisco is a different place than when this center was built. Just as an illustration, 1970, the school district had 93,000 students, 720,000 population. Now, with almost 900,000 people, the school district has about 52,000 students. And the Catholic schools have suffered too. Uh, Wall Street of the West used to be Montgomery Street. Well, the trading uh, building now is a gymnasium. And so we've got to realize, and I think admit, the demographics and environment have changed. And I want to compliment the board for uh, coming forth with that realistic appraisal. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just wanted to say that we are going to put everybody, we want to hear from as many people as possible. But we've got a two minute limit for everybody, so I'll start the timer now for the next speaker. Thank you. I guess I have to be the bad guy here, but there are some rules of decorum that I have to go over. Um, you know, we appreciate you attending this meeting this evening, and we look forward to your questions. Um, I would like to just take a moment to kind of review the guidelines for this open forum. Um, this public meeting will be conducted in an orderly and expeditious manner during the presentation and the comment period. Um, we will all maintain civility, respect, and courtesy. No person will be allowed to engage in conduct that disrupts this meeting, and this includes 
but is not limited to disorderly, threatening, slanderous, profane, and boisterous behavior towards the board, the presenters, and the speakers. It is the discretion of our presiding officer or sergeant of arms to identify any person or persons acting in any disruptive activity, and those parties will be asked to leave the meeting. So, I'm sorry, but you know, we do have guidelines that we have to follow, and I'm sure everybody will be fine. We look forward to all our comments and questions. So, thanks a lot. Hello, my name is Andrew McCarran. I was born and raised in San Francisco, and I grew up here in the Sunset District. My mom is Eta McCarran, and she is world famous here in the Sunset District. <laughs> my parents immigrated to San Francisco back in the 1960s. My father met my mother at the Caribbean. Knights of the Red Branch down at 7th and Mission Street and married in 1960. My mom was from County Cork, Baltimore, a small fishing town, and my father was from County Monaghan, known as Tidy Town of Monaghan, where he worked to develop his carpenter skills building the county hospital. Myself, I've been a carpenter with Local 22 for over 40 years, and currently I'm president of Local 22 and the carpenter supervisor of the Cable Car Restoration Division. Which we restore cable cars of San Francisco built in the late team, uh, 1800 to 1900. In 1974, I was only a wee lad, but I came down here with my father with 50 years of membership of Local 22 and all the other Irishmen, Frank Riley, plasterer, Barney Breen, plasterer, Joe Sullivan, carpenter, Jimmy McCarran, carpenter, John Riley, carpenter, Frank Lynch, plumber, just to name a few to help build this Irish Center. All the carpenters back in the day that worked on the Irish Center were volunteers from Local 22 Carpenters Union. The other trades were also strong union members that volunteered to build this great center. The plumbers were from Local 38 and the sheet metal workers were from 104, the plasters were from Local 66. Everybody back in those days were union and had no problem volunteering. I'll speed it up, I'm sorry. They were all very proud of the Irish roots. With that said, I really hope that the Irish board will reach out to the local unions to help put together a plan and build a brand new Irish culture center that in Irish immigrants and Irish Americans can be very proud of. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Hey, McCartney. Uh, Liam, um, you know, recall the work you and I did in the GAA when we decided to develop those fields on Treasure Island and the entire Irish community, the movers and shakers with the resources to get things done and get stuff built, rallied to the cause and helped us to get it done because we were trying to do something extraordinary. The more ambitious your vision is, I think the more people will rally to your cause and the vision that you've shown us tonight is ambitious and I think it deserves everyone's support. We owe it to the people who built this place to ensure that it is passed on safely to future generations. And in its present form, the building, I'm sorry to say, is not going to cut it. Trying to foothold our way up with incremental improvements and a bit of remodeling there, it's, it's not going to work. We need to be, it needs to be a fundamental rebuild, a fundamental rethink about the full potential of this site and all the wonderful things that we could put here. So be ambitious and think big. Thank you.
I'll ask you down the right shot for Pat Yuniak. Before I start, happy Mother's Day to all the women in the house. I'll put the glasses on, my wife wrote this one. Uh, good evening, my name is John McCormick. I am the current president of the San Francisco Glen Soccer Association. We have over 75 teams in the city, upwards of a thousand members. From not only Irish, Irish American backgrounds, but we are also the most diverse club in the city, from every corner of San Francisco. Many of our current members have strong family ties to the founding members of the Irish Centre. Over the years, we have, have, have held many a function, from hosting Irish soccer legends Packy Bonner, Ray Houghton, the great Ray Houghton scored against England, who will forget it, to kids' discos, social awards. Uh, social events and award ceremonies. Great memories for all. Our club has a Hall of Fame downstairs which showcases on the lower level all the acknowledgements and the achievements of our current members and past members and we are very proud, uh, very proud of our ties to the Irish Centre. We feel that the current size and accessibility of the centre is, is not adequate due to the growth in our community that we need. With the expansion and the new development presented this evening it will offer a safe place for both young and old in our community, and many new resources will be available. The San Francisco Glen Soccer Association fully support this expansion in the Irish Centre and a, a, a place for our kids and kids for future generations to come and enjoy. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, I am Jeff Rodman. Uh, my wife and I have been members of the uh, the center since uh, we moved into the area about 30 years ago. We were one of the, one of the bricks out front. Um, I am an engineer, and uh, my talents lie in making happen the visions of others. Uh, I am frankly overwhelmed by the vision that I saw tonight. I had no expectation of what we would be seeing. I applaud those who went into it, uh, the president, the board, and the architects, and all of those who contributed. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of overwhelmed. Um, the, uh, the price tag of roughly $50 million for, for a San Francisco major project actually does not seem, you know, at, out of the reason. Uh, we are also supporters of the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. Um, and they are uh, completing an $88 million student housing building, right? Uh, so it, it, it's, you set your sights high, um, you establish the vision for everyone to share, and you can do it. Uh, so I uh, am excited about this. We will be uh, contributors on our, on our own scale uh, to this. Um, and uh, I, I thank, thank you all for doing this. I do have one specific question. Uh, and that is that with all of the construction in the area, um, there is going to be increasing competition for infrastructure, uh, for parking, for roads, for uh, you know, rail access. Um, and I am curious as to what the, what the view is to um, how, um, where people will stay, where people will park, um, related things. Um, so, if there are any any thoughts about that uh, from those who are reading this, that's it. thank you very much. That's my question. At the moment, the building has a forty-car park, one-level garage. Parking, we all love parking. The city are really against parking. So a lot of that discussion will happen with the city. You know, they want to go to a transit force no matter whether you're going out at night, no matter where it's going. So that is something that will be in the discussion with the city when we go to planning. And we'll do our best to get as much parking as possible. But on those types of projects, it's not always up to who's developing it to see what happens with the parking. But we would like to get as much as we can. Good evening, my name is James Lee, I'm a son of the sunset and I'd like to say that my father was a 50 year
member of Local 22. Yeah. Other father immigrants from Ireland, and I'd like to uh, say I'd like to support and I'd like to congratulate Liam Reedy for and his board for the outstanding job in which he's trying to rejuvenate uh, um, a raisin on the tree. And what happens is if uh, if if we can't, uh, this is my sister. Not my wife. Oh no. <laughs> so uh, I think any, we support a ongoing effort to rejuvenate the center. And what I heard tonight was that it's uh, money up front, but we need to support it with through uh, monthly membership or annual membership. Is that correct? And so uh, let's do it. It's, uh, it's not working out the way it is. So. I just want to make one comment. I'm Patsy Lee Dolan, <laughs> his sister. Uh, I've been here since the center started. Our parents came from Galway. And I have been a strong supporter of the Irish Cultural Center. And I don't see its heritage and brick and, brick and mortar. I see it in the cultural, uh, the connection of the Irish in San Francisco. And I would love to see it continue, as it has always continued in this wonderful city that we call San Francisco. So I am 100% behind whatever we need to do to keep our center and our culture vibrant and alive in our wonderful city. John Gallagher, um, you've got my checkbook and you've got my support. And I will say this, this place needs to be for the many, not the few. Uh, and I say the many and not the few because in order for us to move forward, uh, we have to change. And I'll give you an example. I grew up in Birmingham, England. And big Irish area, big Irish centre. Uh, two years ago, I was there the month before. and. The Irish Centre was there and it closed down after 50 years. And the Irish built Birmingham. They built the canals, they built the roads, they built the houses. And that all disappeared two years ago, the last sort of bastion. And the Irish Centre, Irish dancing, Irish language schools, uh, all of this matters. If we're going to continue, we have to change. And I applaud the vision. As I say, you've got my checkbook. But the alternative is we lose a huge cultural centre. And San Francisco punches way above its weight and always has. And we have an opportunity to really put us on the map. So uh, I want to thank you all, all the board members, everybody who works here at the UICC. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Sounds like that guy's paying for everything. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. My name is Larry Mazzola. I'm the president of the San Francisco Building Trade Council. Proud to be here tonight. I might be the only Italian here, I'm not sure. But uh, I live right up the road, and I've been here more times than I've been to the Italian Athletic Club. I grew up here, and this is a great center, and we need to do everything we can to save this place and rebuild it, big time. This place cannot go away. We need to rebuild it bigger and better and have this place forever. This is a great community spot that we cannot lose. So I'm in on it, and I'm here to tell you guys that the San Francisco Building Trades is in on it. Uh, I spent many times here in high school, and the one thing I liked back then was all of the different exits for me to get out of here. I'm here. <laughs> so, when we build the next building, please make it so we have a, enough exits for me to get out of here when the shit starts, so I don't get my ass kicked. But seriously, um, you know, Local 38, along with all the other building trades, and Local 22, like Andrew said, uh, built this place. And the McCormick family, Dan McCormick, who was a Local 38 uh, legend, 
uh, built this place. They, you know, the McCormick family worked as plumbers during the day, came here after work, and, and donated their time at night. And a lot of the building trades guys did that too. So we just want to let you know that uh, we expect this to be a building trades job, and we're going to help you as much as we can. And thank you, and let the Irish Center live on. Good evening, everyone. My name is Eric O'Neill. I'm a local practicing engineer, and um, I uh, come to get to know the some of the board members here over the last couple of months. I have been absolutely blown away by what the architectural team have put together tonight. It's as an engineer, I'm salivating just thinking about the, the whole concept coming to, to life. I am really being in the business and knowing the difficulties ahead in the planning process. I have seen so many projects get chopped up by the planning department and neighborhood groups and special interests. The question here is, is this something that the planning department will sign off on? Will it approve? It's housing first, is there, is there a mantra at the moment? If so, and I truly hope it, it is the case, then what is the timeline? Uh, if you can get the funding, the five million in the next three months, and it, what's the timeline? And in that same vein, I am here to assist in any way possible. I was lukewarm uh, coming into this, but when I saw this presentation, it just simply blew me away. And whatever I can do to help, and everyone I know, I'm very happy. We don't, this is a concept, we have to start someplace. And we had to put this out there, this concept, this vision of what we would like to see. We do not know what the planning department, we hope that they will enthusiastically support the project. But you just don't know, like we have been through for 25 years with the planning department in San Francisco. What, what you think they will love, they turn down. What you think, well, maybe this will get through, they love it. You just, there is no, but we will find out all that. As regards the timeline, after the next few weeks, we move on from this now, from tonight. There will be an exec, there's not near enough people here tonight, as somebody said, to get this approved and to get it supported in the Bay Area. We need a huge amount of people behind this project. We'll be setting up executive board, We'll be setting up a building committee, we'll be setting up a finance committee, and an administration committee. So all this is out ahead of us. That's the structure that's going to be set up to get this approved. We have started working on it, but so far we've just put the names on paper because the, the, the deal was to try and get the concept before you tonight. The timeline for construction. We want to build tomorrow. That's, you know, that's how we look at it. Realistically, it would be 18 months before this would be approved at the soonest to start construction. And it will take two, two years to two and a half years to build. So it's a four-year project from today on to get that project built here in San Francisco. And that's with everything going well. No major objections by neighbors, no major objections over traffic and stuff like that. But we are hopeful that we can get it approved in some form. It might be very different to what you're looking at today. It might be exactly what you're looking at today. There's no guarantees in San Francisco. So just to wrap up here, uh, you have some homework. As you exit tonight's meeting, you'll be handed one of these uh, brochures. It's a postcard of the project itself, and it has, of course, the irishcentre2025.org on there. And when you go home tonight, there will be a live button on there that you will help you. It's live now, Tom. Our tech guy tells me it's live right now. So if you click on the website, and, you know, you can mingle away down on Mobona Gates. Please participate in the survey, because it will help us to, to generate some uh, baseline data for you for us to make decisions later on if the time comes as to what to put into this building so go on to the website take the survey it's an anonymous uh, survey and you'll hear more about we have some resolutions to pass next week at the members meeting 
Those resolutions will in involve things like setting up an alt adjacent committees to the operational board and with some other small changes to make to the bylaws about cultural programming, which haven't been updated since we became a 501c7, c3. So, thank you for your, your, your support tonight of this project to kind of, you know, move it along to the next stage, which is next Thursday night, May the 13th. We are going to have an in-person and a Zoom call next week on Thursday night at 7.30. So, mark your calendars, participate in the survey, and go out there and tell everybody about the Irish Centre 2025 project.